The margins of mountain belts are important places for sediment accumulation. We call these sites foreland basins. And they form, or are believed to form, by the flexing of the lithosphere adjacent to the mountain ranges. In this video, we'll be looking at the large-scale behaviour of foreland basins, specifically the role of the orogenic belt as a load, which will act on the adjacent lithosphere. And we'll look at how the strength of this supporting lithosphere also controls the shape and substance history of the foreland basin. So let's start off with a simple conceptualization of the lithosphere as an elastic beam, rather like a springboard. And we'll load this beam with a mountain belt of thickened crust. And of course, it doesn't just sit there proud. If it's a springboard, that load will subside, supported by the strength of the springboard. In other words, it flexes. The result is the adjacent area to the load is subsided along with the load. And this is a so-called flexural basin. This flexure is a waveform. So under the basin, the lithosphere has gone down. And just adjacent to it, the lithosphere rises slightly, creating a so-called peripheral bulge. The peripheral bulge is only going to be an uplift of a, of a few hundred metres at most. And in many situations, it will be hard to recognise over the normal noise of the relief of the flexing crust. But let's just consider this form. So we have a load, we have a flexural basin next to it, and a very low peripheral bulge out beyond it. But of course, we're dealing with a dynamic situation. And in mountain belts, the crustal shortening relates to plate convergence. Therefore, our load will migrate. So this is a dynamic situation. So let's see what happens as we migrate the load. And we can track this by using those three markers on the flexing plate. The green marker on the peripheral bulge, the yellow marker, which is just at the very feather edge of the flexural basin, and another red marker that's very close to the load. So now our load, our mountain belt, has moved, and it's moved over the old basin margin close to it, over the red marker. What was the feather edge of the basin has gone down, and what was on the peripheral bulge is now the feather edge of the flexural basin. So as the load migrates, so too does the basin. Well, let's explore this idea here, which is part of South America. We're looking down on the margins of the Andes, and the Andes are the high ground on the left, represented by their very arid-looking dry landscape. The right-hand side of the image, with the fields and the forests, forms the so-called Chaco Basin. And it's in this position here that sediment is accumulating that's been flushed off the Andean mountain chain. Well, let's add some geology. Let's first of all put on the extent of the Chaco Basin as we see it today, here. So these are areas where there's effectively active sedimentation. Let's put on the rest of the regional geology. So we've got orogenic belt, the Andes over on the left hand side, and it's this that's acting as a load on the South American lithosphere. Separating the orogenic belt from the fallen basin is a thrust belt where some of the older parts of the fallen basin have been caught up in the advancing Andean origin. So this is the basic setup, an orogenic belt load, the Andes, flexing the South American plate, creating a fallen basin, the Chaco Basin. So let's look at how this is represented geologically on a cross section through the edge of the fallen basin and just into the thrust belt. So a number of features that we can pick out. First of all, the tertiary rocks at the top there are the fill to the fallen basin. And beneath it, we can see the Carboniferous, Devonian, Silurian and basement rocks that are inclined down to the west towards the Andes. So the pre-orogenic strata are inclined, flexed down towards the mountain belt. Let's add some more detail. And these are the various components of the tertiary strata. This pecked blue line is the base of the 4D mega sequence. And you'll see that above this, the tertiary strata in those various orange and yellow colours pinch out towards the east, away from the origin. This pinch out can be dated. 
and so the feather edge of the basin has migrated over 10 million years out towards the east, reflecting the migration of the basin and presumably, therefore, the orogenic load of the Andes as the crustal shortening has progressed. Notice that the western side of our basin is deformed as that deformation has continued, folding the four deep sediments. So evidence then of a migrating and evolving orogenic load. So this is the classical four deep fallen basin model with a finite pinch out in the feather edge of the basin away from the orogenic load. And we can chart the evolution of the stratigraphy through time and distance. So this is the triangle in yellow is the finite pinch out feather edge of the fallen basin. So as we move the load in to the left across here, the outer edge migrates through time like this. So we have a stratigraphic evolution of our basin. The pinch out migrates and the vertical succession also evolves as the load migrates towards the foreland. So on a large scale, the stratigraphy of our fallen basin is charting the orogenic processes. So let's come back to our simple cartoon for the springboard and the support of our load by an elastic beam. The ability of this beam to support the load will depend on its strength. Let's just explore this a minute. So here we've got a stretched out green elastic band. And onto that, we're going to suspend a load represented by that beaker with uh, pebbles in it. We've also put a marker, which is that skewer pointing upwards so we can see how the load behaves. So let's support it in the elastic band. That beaker of pebbles has pulled down the elastic band, creating a flexural depression. And we can see how far down the beaker has subsided by looking at the top of that um, skewer there. So this is our marker height. Now let's just change the strength of our elastic band. So we'll replace our green elastic band with a stronger black one. And now this stronger band has not subsided as much. The load is supported by the stronger band. And because the load has not subsided so much, the top of our marker has not gone down as far either. So our new marker height is higher than our old one. So the height of the load depends on the strength of the lithosphere that is supporting it. A load rides higher on a stronger band, a mountain belt will ride higher on a stronger lithosphere. Well in geology when we talk about the elastic strength of the lithosphere that's usually reported in terms of an effective elastic thickness. Effective elastic thickness doesn't correspond to any particular geological feature in the Earth. It's simply a proxy for the integrated strength of the lithosphere. A high effective elastic thickness means strong lithosphere. So let's start off with a weaker lithosphere with a low effective elastic thickness. This means that the load subsides more strongly the associated flexural basin is narrow and deep. Contrast that with stronger lithosphere that is supporting our load. This has a higher effective elastic thickness. The resultant flexural basin is wide and not as deep as for the weaker lithosphere situation. So the form of our fallen basin depends not only on the load, but also on the strength of the lithosphere upon which it's formed. Weak lithosphere, deep flexural basins, strong lithosphere, shallower flexural basins. Correspondingly, you'd expect the peripheral bulge for the weak lithosphere situation to be more pronounced and very subdued peripheral bulge when the lithosphere is stronger. And as we saw with our elastic band experiment, the load, the topography of the mountains, will be higher for stronger lithosphere than for mountain belts supported by weaker lithosphere. Well, we can explore these concepts by looking at some examples from nature. There's some pretty wide fallen basins that we can see um, on the Indian continent and on the um, side of Arabia, 
there. But in the northern part of the map, the fallen basins are rather narrow. Let's look at one of these narrow basins to start with. Here, on the southern margin of the Caucasus Mountains. Here we are looking in a Google Earth image towards the west along the mountain range and its associated fallen basin. The estimated effective elastic thickness for the lithosphere that's coming in from the south beneath the Caucasus Mountains is only 30 to 40 kilometers. Weak lithosphere. Consequently, the basin that is supported by this lithosphere is narrow. It's only about 40 kilometers wide or less between the orogenic belt and the unsubsided fallen. So a narrow basin when the effective elastic thickness is low. We can contrast that with the situation in front of the Himalayas, where the Himalayas are overriding the Indian lithosphere. This has an effective elastic thickness of over 100 kilometers. It's old, cold lithosphere and correspondingly stronger. And the width of the fallen basin is at least 200 kilometers. It's a pretty neat illustration of how strong lithosphere can support a very wide fallen basin. And of course, the orogenic load sits high in the Himalayas, with peaks rising to over eight kilometers high, in contrast to the Caucasus. So we can compare our two cases, a low effective elastic thickness of maybe 40 or 50 kilometers for the lithosphere adjacent to the Caucasus generates a narrow fallen basin. Stronger lithosphere in the situation of the Indian lithosphere adjacent to the Himalayas has a high effective elastic thickness and a correspondingly wide fallen basin and high mountains because the load is riding higher. Well, these are some simple cartoons, but of course we can make this more complicated. There are other loads, not just thick and crust. These are generally called subsurface loads. And an example could be dense material that's carried up onto our lithosphere. For example, a mantle slice. So in place, mantle slices act as subsurface loads. An additional one, which is also potentially really important, is an attached subducted oceanic slab pulling down the adjacent continental lithosphere. So it's not just thick and crust that can load the lithosphere. A key point about these subsurface loads is they'll pull down the mountain belt. So you may have lower mountains or even no mountains. It may be entirely a submarine situation and a correspondingly deeper fallen basin. OK, so let's return to this diagram about stratigraphy. And our stratigraphic model that we used here is somewhat simplistic. It essentially assumes that our basin is brimful, in which case the sedimentation is limited simply by the feather edge of our basin area. Well, here's an example of a brimful basin. We're looking into Iraq here with the Zagros Mountains acting as a load on the right and the undeformed Arabian foreland on the left. So here's our fallen basin and it's brimful, it's land. But if we step back, we can see that this basin continues to the east into the Arabian Gulf. Submarine and therefore room to accumulate more sediment. In the water area there, the basin is so-called underfilled. So we have an overfilled part of the basin where it's brimful on land and an underfilled area as a continuation along strike. This is also an interesting image because it shows that the filling of this fallen basin is lateral. It's along the length of the basin, not so much directly from where the load is. So our basin is being filled from the side. Well, we were just looking at this basin down here on the margin of the Arabian continent. What we're going to look at now is here where there's another underfilled fallen basin area where the Apennines are thrusting. Let's zoom into this area here. Here we're looking from the Taranto Gulf in the Mediterranean onto mainland Italy, with the Apennines on the left, that's to the west, and a foreland to the east. The fallen basin continues from onshore 
in the north to offshore in the south. So it changes from being overfilled in the north to underfilled in the south. Subaerial in the north, submarine in the south. So let's consider an underfilled basin. And in this particular case, it's potentially driven by a greater subsurface load, but also potentially by pre-existing bathymetry. The plate that's being flexed was not subaerial to start with. So let's look at the seismic expression of this submarine deposition. So here we are, looking at a seismic section. The foreland is on the right there. The thrust belt, the origin, is on the left. And you can see in the middle the horizontal strata onlapping the foreland. The basin fill, therefore, of our foreland basin onlaps the foreland, which is tilted towards the origin. But the pinch out of those deposits relates to, not to the migration of the basin simply, but to the sediment supply into our underfilled basin. So in this case, we can't use the pinch out simply to infer migration of the orogenic wedge. It could simply reflect different sediment supply coming into our basin. And sediment supply, as we saw from the Arabian situation, is a three-dimensional problem. Consequently, in this particular case, you would expect the fallen basin fill to evolve from being underfilled to start with, and as the river systems uh, from Iraq migrate out into the marine area, the basin system will evolve from being underfilled to overfilled. So this stratigraphic expression will evolve through time. Let's now return to this simple cartoon showing a load of thrust wedge and a subsurface load flexing the pink plate. What happens if we reduce the load? This could happen by detaching a continuation of an oceanic slab, so-called slab break-off, or it could happen by um, normal faulting off the back of the thrust wedge, or just simple erosion of the thrust wedge. What's going to happen is we'll take mass off our springboard, so the springboard will go up. A waning load reduces the flexure and generates uplift, so consequently we'll generate regression, if it's an underfilled basin, out across our thrust wedge. And we can recognise this here, for example, on Sicily, where late Pliocene marine strata are now over a kilometre above sea level, rebounded up as the orogenic load has been removed, so that the fallen basin succession has bounced out of the Mediterranean. So that's a quick tour of the large-scale stratigraphic expression and some of the dynamics behind fallen basins. We've looked at the role of the orogenic load and of the strength of the supporting lithosphere in controlling the overall form of fallen basins. To take this further, we'd need to look at how the thrust belt that lies at the side of the advancing orogenic load cannibalizes the fallen basin fill, as well as providing local sites to pond sediment and provide local depositional environments. But that's for a different video.